It wasn't quality stocks doing well. It wasn't safe stocks doing well. Um, it was story stocks, or what they call sometimes glamour stocks. That's the tough environment for our process. We kept trying to prove to ourselves that maybe value is never going to work again. And we kept concluding, no, it's going to work again. The world's just gone crazy. I think the main thing we did, which was not so easy, was to stick with our process. And then it kicked in big time in the last really two years. Cliff Asnes was supposed to be a professor of finance and economics. I'm like, well, we're studying class is interesting, but the research I really like. I asked him a very naive question because the answer is very obvious. What do I do if I want to do what you guys do? And they said, you, you get a PhD. But along the way, he changed paths, leaving academia for a role at Goldman Sachs. I was there in the summer of 91, and then I went for a year in 92, thinking I'm taking a year off the PhD program just to, to see if I like this. I'm on you know, year 31 of that sabbatical, so it, it does appear to have stuck. And for the past 25 years, he's been running AQR, the hedge fund he founded in 1998. Asnes is a so-called quant, an investor who uses data insights and computer algorithms as a method to build portfolios. And his strategy? Find cheap stocks and bet on them long term. What quants call value, and I say quants, I mean practitioners like me and academics, is basically price to fundamentals. If something looks cheap, scaled by some fundamental, and the cheap tend to outperform the expensive. That trade took a heavy beating for years after the financial crisis, but has recently started to pay off again. 2022 was AQR's best year on record. Its longest running fund gained more than 43%. At the end of the day, you go, no, we think this is a giant dislocation and we're gonna plant our feet and say, all right, most of the time we try to make money the easy way. Uh, we're gonna make even more money this time, but it's gonna be the hard way. That happened then and it happened now. Let's talk about the environment we operate in today. Uh, we have high inflation. The Federal Reserve has been jacking up interest rates fairly steadily for more than a year or so. Um, do you think that's the right strategy? And do you think the result would likely be a so-called hard landing as we could talk today? Okay, uh, first I gotta give you the disclaimer. I am the quant geek, long and short, so I don't pretend to be a great macroeconomist, but of course it's a backdrop, and of course we look at our strategies and, and we think about what macroeconomic environment are our positions implying we favor. Um, I don't think the Fed had much of a choice. I think they were slightly behind the curve. My biggest concern, and probably our firm's biggest concern, is stocks and bonds seem to be taking a very, very different view. Bonds, um, whether it's a risk premium or a forecast of future interest rates, if it's a forecast of future interest rates, what's priced into the short-term curve is multiple severe cuts over the next year to two years. That is a recession and not a mild one in the forecast. Equities are kind of, I'm not saying it's a graveyard, but they're whistling past that. Um, it, it, so. That doesn't mean bonds are right. Um, equities could be right. You could get the, uh, what some people have called the immaculate deflation, where inflation comes down and, and growth doesn't suffer. But if inflation stays sticky, or it comes down because we enter a non-trivial recession, uh, it's equities that I think are, 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 are a scary place. They're not priced very consistently with bonds, and we're gonna find out who's right in the next year. What are you most worried about in the global economy now? Is it uh, the geopolitical environment, U.S., China, Ukraine? Is it uh, on inability to pass the debt limit extension? What are you most worried about? I think most of the time I would answer the same way, uh, a financial crisis. As a human, I worry a lot about the Chinese invading Taiwan and World War III coming on. But in that case, I don't think whether you invest with David Rubenstein or Cliff Asens is the really big issue. So I, I think a financial crisis I worry about uh, for, uh, of course, they're very unpredictable. After the fact, everyone predicted them. Uh, but before the fact, they're not very predictable. I don't think anyone wants a financial crisis. You think you'll do well, and something happens that boomerangs and, and you don't. Well, as we talk, we've seen Silicon Valley Bank uh, basically go under and have to be bought. Um, and there are other banks that have some challenges. Are you worried about a banking crisis or not so much? Worried enough to, to put it on my worry list. 
I have no special knowledge of, of, of banks, commercial real estate and banks that deal in that, maybe a more nerve wracking place, how that shakes out in cities. So yeah, I, those things worry me, uh, but not especially more. I think even before SVB, I would have said, uh, financial crisis is a very low probability. When someone says their biggest worry, it doesn't mean they think it's likely. They just think, they just mean they think it's possible and would be terrible. So let's talk a bit about your background and how you came to start this company. Uh, where were you born? I was born in Queens, New York. Into a middle class family? Middle class family. And were you a math wizard when you were growing up? Uh, if so, I didn't know it. Um, I was certainly a, a mathy kid, a nerdy kid. Um, you know, uh, video games, Dungeons and Dragons, it was the 80s. Where did you do well in high school? Every parent-teacher conference used the words underachiever. He's not trying that hard. He's phoning it in. Um, different era. You could still get in college with good SAT scores and a B-plus uh, average. Uh, but I definitely cruised through high school without ever really, really trying. I had fun in high school. And then you went to Wharton? I went to a dual degree program at Penn between the Wharton School and the Engineering School. And you got a summa degree? Uh, well, it's very nice of you to mention it. Uh, summa but yes, cum laude. Summa cum laude and both. And then you decided to go right to Wall Street or you decided to go to graduate school? I decided to go to graduate school. I had done some work as, a, as an undergrad uh, just for money, uh, computer programming work for some Wharton professors, helping them with their research. And so I was coding up the tests that we were doing, and I just liked it. Uh, I'm, I'm like, well, we're studying class is interesting, but the research I really like. I asked them a very naive question because the answer is very obvious. What do I do if I want to do what you guys do? And they said, you, you get a PhD. Um, and I said, where do I go for that? And they all said, shut the door. Because um, I was at Wharton, nothing bad about Wharton. I still love my alma mater. But nine out of 10 of these conversations were, go to Chicago. So you went to the University of Chicago, but to get an MBA and a PhD in yeah. economics. So there you were a research assistant for Eugene Fama who won the Nobel Prize in economics for, among other things, uh, you would say the efficient market theory, which is to say it's very difficult over a longer time to beat the markets. You work for him as an assistant, but you're now every day trying to beat the markets. So how do you square those two? Um, I actually think we agree on a ton more than we disagree. Gene uh, works very closely with a fantastic firm, Dimensional uh, Advisors. Um, where they, it's not exactly the same. We believe in momentum more than dimensional. They believe in what's called the size effect more than we do, but we overlap a lot. Where we maybe still disagree is there's this famously long and boring fight in academia about why a strategy works. After deciding it does work, that's the key to the real world, does it work? In academia, you wanna know why. Uh, and uh, fights have always broken down into do they work for Gene Fama, efficient market kind of reasons. If something is riskier than something else, it's efficient and rational for it to get a higher return. And then there are behavioral reasons. Errors investors make a strategic work. I've moved more towards the error side in my career. So you got your MBA and your PhD, and you're ready to be an academic, but then you went to the dark side. You joined Goldman Sachs. How did you explain to Gene Fama you're going to Goldman Sachs and just becoming a money person? Well, Gene definitely saw it as the dark side. Um, his immediate response was, why do you want to go be a salesman? And I said something like, I'm not in sales, I'm in research. He's like, they're all salesmen. Um, I think that's a bit of an exaggeration. All right, so you leave in what year? We left uh, at at the very beginning of 98. What did you raise initially? We raised a billion dollars. We very quickly realized to launch a traditional money manager, you needed a five-year track record on your own, not just from Goldman. You needed to look more like I look now than I look then, a little, little gray beard, maybe not, not so much hair. But to launch a hedge fund, you needed to have a good pedigree, a good track record of whatever length, and to say you're closing. That really helped. Uh, we probably could have raised $2 billion, which was more about the market than it was about us, but we hard capped it at one. Okay, so you have a billion dollars, you get started, and you do reasonably well from the beginning? No. No. Um, about a year and a half in, um, I, would, I would tell when, uh, people when they'd ask similar questions, I'd go, well, we raised a billion dollars, and through diligence, hard work, and some good calls, we've turned that into half a billion dollars. 
So did and the investors didn't say, give me my money back? Some did, uh, but many didn't, and some gave us more. I told you we only launched a hedge fund, and this was stupid of me. We only launched a very aggressive hedge fund, targeting about a third more swings than the stock market. Hopefully those swings aren't very correlated to the stock market, that's the point, but trying to make an awful lot of money. The tech bubble, much like 18 through 20, um, they always say history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. I think these two are in between. I think it rhymes really well. <laughs> it doesn't perfectly repeat. We saw cheap stocks, as quants would define them in the simplistic way, be destroyed by expensive stocks. That's the tough environment for our process. Um, 18 through 20 was a very similar environment. Uh, I like to joke, almost all the time, our job is about brains. Once every 20 years, it's about another word that starts with B. And I think this is key to retaining clients. You can't fake it. They have to get that you're not just defending yourself, that you're trying to figure out what's going on. At the end of the day, you go, no, we think this is a giant dislocation, and we're going to plant our feet and say, all right, most of the time we try to make money the easy way. Uh, we're going to make even more money this time, but it's going to be the hard way. That happened then, and it happened now. I think the main thing we did, which was not so easy, was to stick with our process. And then it kicked in big time in the last really two years. In 2022, investors came to a fork in the road. The path they chose made all the difference. Those who chose growth stocks ended up trailing value investors by a factor of three. And in percentage terms, growth lost to value stocks by the most since 2000. In a year when the Federal Reserve dominated headlines by raising interest rates in an attempt to lower inflation, it was no surprise that growth stocks would be hurt. These are stocks that tend to outperform the market based on prospective growth and have the potential to do better when rates are falling. And they may be the first to decline when the economy cools off. As a result, the going got tough for supercharged tech stocks like Meta, Amazon, and Google, that dominated the decade after the financial crisis. In their place came value, stocks that are considered cheap compared to their revenues, like energy names, ExxonMobil and Occidental, as well as insurance and food companies. Quantitative bulls have been saying it for years, value was due for a win. Anti-growth forces such as rising bond yields and a hawkish Fed made it happen. Last year, 2022, was a year that your longest serving fund turned out to have a rate of return over 40% annualized. What did you do last year that made that fund perform so well? Basically, we did something fairly similar to what we do every year. We have a process that involves value investing, trend following, quality investing, looking for positive carry, looking for good momentum uh, that had suffered a lot from 18 through 20, all from the value component. We analyzed that. We kept trying to prove to ourselves that maybe value is never going to work again. And we kept concluding, no, it's going to work again. The world's just gone crazy. Uh, so I, I think the main thing we did, which was not so easy, was to stick with our process. And then it kicked in big time in the last really two years. Now, Warren Buffett is a famous value investor. But in the quant world, which you are very important in, is value investing the same in the quant world? Value investing being you're buying something that is supposedly worth a dollar for 50 cents. Yeah, it's related, but it is not the same. And this has caused no end of confusion. What quants call value, and I say quants, I mean practitioners like me and academics, is basically price to fundamentals. If something looks cheap, scaled by some fundamental, we all might argue about what the best one is, price to earnings, sales, cash flow, free cash flow, some proprietary measure of fundamental strength. And the cheap tend to outperform the expensive long term. That is the famous academic value effect. That is not the holistic measure of value a guy like Warren Buffett or any Graham and Dodd style value investor would look at. Um, in fact, they get quite annoyed uh, sometimes. Uh, they go, that's not value, that's just price. You're just saying it's cheap. Value is, is it cheap versus the growth opportunities, versus the moats around it, versus the safety of the stock, versus good things happening. If it ever gets this far, the quant should explain, we believe in all those same things, just semantically, we call those separate factors. 
and we add it up. But that little miscommunication has caused a lot of, of, of differences. If you look at Warren Buffett's track record, as amazing as it is, no one would call Warren Buffett a quant. Yet he is very correlated with what quants would call the value factor, the low risk factor, and the profitability factor. He buys companies that make a lot of money, aren't very risky, and then he looks for a decent price. It's not the first thing he looks for. Warren Buffett has famously said that if you were to take, uh, let's say, your money and put it into a public equity index fund over a 10 year period of time, you will do much better than if you put it in the best hedge funds over that 10 year period of time. You run a very well known hedge fund. What do you think of Warren Buffett's view? It's one of these situations that's odd where I do think there are places and smart things you can do that can ex exceed as a portfolio, uh, just the S&P 500. He's still giving good advice for the average person listening to it. It's advice I've given uh, on my own. I've been at conferences where people have asked me what to invest in and I've gotten a sense they were very unsure and I've said, uh, unfortunately he's passed now, but I've said, I have a good friend named Jack Bogle. You might, you might want to look, look him up. Founder it's, of Vanguard. Founder of Vanguard. Not a bad uh, piece of advice. I think head to head, uh, there was a famous bet along this line and Warren uh, won it by leaps and bounds. Um, I think Warren's going to win that bet more often than not, but I don't think it's the right bet. A hedge fund properly constructed is meant to be added to a portfolio and make an overall portfolio better, allow you to do other things elsewhere, increase risk adjusted return. It's not necessarily supposed to blow away the S&P. So speaking of portfolios, sure. uh, recently uh, BlackRock said through one of its institutes that maybe the traditional 60-40 ratio, which is to say 60% in equities, 40% in debt, is something which has been accepted for a long time as a very good portfolio construct, may not be the thing of the future. Maybe 60-40 is outdated. you have a view on that? Yeah. Um, I think outdated is going too far. Uh, somebody who owns a 60-40 portfolio and sticks with it from here over the long term doesn't panic, uh, doesn't get greedy and try to double up if they think it's, it looks, you know, doesn't try to time it. I still think they're going to they're gonna make decent money. Um, I do think they're going to make less than they did, say, in the 20th century. So the next question is, can you do better than that? And here I feel a little guilty because I'm going to kind of agree with BlackRock, but I'm also going to admit that I think I would say this in any environment. I think there are uncorrelated or low correlated diversifiers you can add to a portfolio to make it better. Um, when the portfolio itself, say 6040, is offering you very large long term expected returns because markets are scared and everything looks cheap, you still want to do a little better. But let's suppose I'm an average person and watching you and saying, um, you're a very smart person, maybe I'll give you money. But on the other hand, I'm nervous because there's a war in Ukraine, US China relations are very bad. Inflation is very high. Interest rates are going up. Maybe I'll just sit at home and keep my money under the mattress. Why is that a bad idea? You know, the old Rothschild, buy, buy when there's blood in the streets. When the world's, you know, scared, be greedy, and the world's greedy, be scared. I think everyone is scared, and that would push you to say maybe it's not a terrible time. When I look at the prices of assets, I would greatly prefer in a time like you just described when things are scarier than normal. I would really like it much more if, if those, this scary time corresponded to cheap assets, not assets at least not as bad as 2021, but on the expensive side. I think the, the opportunity and value that we didn't start talking about till 2018, um, value loss for eight years post GFC. We did very well. We had not all value. End of 2020, after COVID, it looked ridiculously cheap. It looked more uh, cheap on our measures than even the dot-com bubble of 99, 2000, which I experienced and never thought I'd experience again. So I am talking my own uh, book, if you will, uh, but we love the value trade. One day we won't be value anymore. Again, we go through long periods where we trade negatively correlated in, in geek speak to value. This is not one of them. Um, we also like some alternatives such as trend following strategies. Trend following strategies can have long periods of not doing much for you, but tend to like macroeconomic volatility. It's kind of their reason for living. And I, I don't think, you know, nothing's a certainty, but, but just like what you said, I tend to think we'll be in a period of macroeconomic volatility for a while.
I look at our returns every day. I look at, I'm like, I think we should have made money today and we didn't make a lot. What happened? I'm very, very involved in, in that, but I do not approve every trade. So you started with a billion. Yeah. You took it down to 500 million. But what do you manage today? Just about $100 billion. And you have a goal to make it at a higher or? Um, Every, every manager probably has a goal to make it higher, but we don't, we don't write down numbers we hope to hit. We just hope to do well and have it grow. On your company, uh, how many employees do you have today? About five to 600. Every trade that's done has to be approved by you in some way? No, uh, that, that would be exhausting. We have processes. We have a million checks. Uh, anything out of the ordinary comes to me very quickly, uh, but we trade Many days we trade thousands of securities. I'd be signing uh, things, things all day. I look at our returns every day. I look at, I'm like, I think we should have made money today and we didn't make a lot. What happened? Trying to dig in. I'm very, very involved in, in that, but I do not approve every trade. What type of people do you hire? All math PhDs or that kind of equivalent? First, yes, we do hire a fair amount of math or economics or finance, computer science PhDs. There are some amazing researchers who came with, with a very different path. If, if someone was an art history major, and one of my daughters is, and so I'm not putting it down, uh, but it, you don't expect them necessarily to be the one who wants to do quant stock selection research, but it does happen. Um, they learn something, they read on their own, there are autodidacts, uh, but as a fishing hole, where are you gonna look for? Yeah, for researchers, we start in that kind of rarefied academic world. Some are PhD students, some are new PhDs, some we convinced to leave academia and, and, and come join us. But that's hardly the whole firm. We got a few hundred people doing research, but we got a few hundred people doing other things. There's room for all kinds of skills here. One thing I think our firm excels at is explaining some things that, I don't think they're as complicated as people think, but maybe intimidating. When you hear the word quant, I'm not explaining things in English and, 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 and describing it. And there you, you have to fish in a different hole. So uh, a couple final rapid fire kind of questions. So Please. if I said to you, I have $100,000 to invest, and to me that's meaningful, where should I put $100,000? Um, subject to risk tolerance, I'll tell you what I'm doing with my own and my kids' money. Um, we, have, we have our money pretty gigantically overexposed to this long short value trade that, that I'm speaking of. It's not an entire portfolio. And for an individual, I'd have to do a little more coaching. You know, this could get worse before it gets better. Um, but I'm eating my own cooking, and I'd have to lead with that advice. What is the most common in mistake that investors make? Oh, I've made every one of them. I would probably go with obsessing about every line in the portfolio, more so than the total portfolio. You gotta look at the lines. How am I doing here? Is the manager doing what they said they were doing? But very often, you build a portfolio. So different parts are working at different times. And I've been on a ton of investment committees. I know you've run many investment committees. At least the ones I've been on, we tend to talk about the two at the bottom uh, all the time, which is fair, but you gotta ask yourself, why are they there? Is this their time? Should they be there? Uh, and you should ask the same questions about those at the top. Are they taking too much risk? So I think people have to look at the line items, but number one should always remember, they're building a portfolio. They're not buying individual slots in the portfolio. What's the best investment advice you've ever received? Uh, pretty much every week, my wife tells me, stop looking at the screen. You'll be a happier, you'll be a happier man, and she'll be a uh, happier person married to, to a happier man.